David was uh, talking about teaching on the fall of man today. The supplemental reading that we have for that is, and I think it was on the slide, Major Bible Themes by Lewis Bray Chafer. And David said he was shocked to open up the section on the fall of man and see my picture there. And uh, I said, I wasn't shocked. I remember taking that picture. But anyway, all right. We're going to continue a study in grace, uh, probably going to carry over to next week also. Uh, I got into this after we finished our study in the book of Revelation. I, I started looking at the topic of grace, and um, it's just, it's really, if you really think about it, it's a fascinating topic to, to look into. While we think about that, let me remind us of our scripture that we read every week, that uh, all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. We need to be diligent to present, our God, uh, present ourselves to God as workmen who do not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Therefore, as James says, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. And finally, we need to prove ourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. So before I get too far, I do want to thank Doug Light. You see these nice monitor stands that he built for me. So now I have a monitor on both sides so that I can forget what I'm doing twice as much. So I have, anyway, so as if you think it's kind of strange that I'm not looking out and I'm looking down here, it's only because I don't know what I'm doing and I have to be reminded. So anyway, so we're looking at the topic of grace. How many of you have stopped to think about the grace of God this week? That's good. I did too because I was studying it all week, but I had to question myself, would I have stopped this week and thought about it had I not been studying it? I had to ask myself that question uh, because this is, uh, I hate to ever say this is the biggest topic in scripture, but it, it's up there. It's in the top five. I mean, it's probably in the top two. I don't know, but it's a massive topic. It's, it's a very important topic for us. And not only us, as you remember last week, as we were walking through different aspects of, as a matter of fact, let's just, uh, well, well, we'll review in just a second. But as we were looking through, one of the things we looked at were the different uh, char um, uh, different types of grace that is shown. And one of them was common grace. Common grace being that which God shows to all mankind, whether they're believers or not. And that common grace is experienced in particular uh, by those who are not believers, because you can look at it this way. Uh, had God not exercised grace uh, at the fall of Adam and Eve, what would have happened? Uh, he would have taken them out immediately, and, and that would be it. And he, maybe he would have recreated a, a new Adam and Eve, who knows? But because of his grace uh, and his divine plan from eternity past, he allowed sin to enter into the world, but not to uh, take total control in the sense that he had a plan to take care of the sin of man through his son, Jesus Christ. That's grace. So his grace goes all the way back to Genesis and extends all the way through eternity future. As we looked, as we saw in the book of Revelation. And one of the things I looked at this week that I thought was really interesting, I wanted to share with you is, is grace versus justice and mercy. Uh, what, do, what are these topics looking at or how do they differ from one another? Well, for one thing, justice is getting what we do deserve, right? If justice were carried out upon, people nowadays are screaming out for justice. We want justice and all this and that. But what they're not understanding is if they were truly given justice from God, uh, we'd all be in hell. I mean, that's just the way it is, Right. Fortunately, God exercised mercy, and mercy is not getting what we do deserve, which is justice. And then comes grace, and grace is getting what we do not deserve, which is the righteousness of Christ that is given to us when we believe in him. And I just thought that was a really neat way of looking at things. And so we're looking at that third aspect, grace, that getting what we do not deserve, again, which is forgiveness, it's, uh, uh, well, we're going to get into different things that, that go along with that as we walk through this. So I won't jump ahead too much. All right. So last week we looked at some testimonies of grace. 
uh, we looked at different terms in the Old Testament and New Testament that define or, or reveal to us what grace is. We looked at some characteristics of grace, and from all, those first three things, we uh, uh, determined a good definition of grace, which, as we just saw, one way of looking at it is grace is getting what we do not deserve. But it is grace literally meaning that we uh, receive the favor of God undeserved, unmerited, unearned, just because he desires to do so, okay? And so as uh, uh, Michael uh, Easley, a pastor, uh, once said that grace is God's unmerited favor or unearned favor in the face of deserved wrath. That's what grace is. So we looked at the categories of grace, which was the common grace and salvific grace or particular grace, the grace that saves. So today what I want to look at uh, are two things, the last two things, and we're going to begin with the need for grace, and out of the need for grace, we're going to see what some of the results of grace are, okay? So let's go back. We talked about common grace last week, so I want to look at common grace and human existence today. Common grace and human existence. First of all, we go to Ephesians 2, 3. Now, don't go, well, you can go ahead and go there because we're going to come to this in just a few minutes. Matter of fact, don't even bother going there yet because what I want to do is get your Bibles out. We're going to have a Bible drill. And the first one to the passage stands up and, okay, we won't do that, but I, I just want you ready because I want you to turn to these passages if you can, okay? Um, if you don't have a Bible and you don't have 28,000 Bibles on your phone like all the rest of us do, there should be a pew Bible in front of you. You can use that, okay? But what I mean by universal sin nature? Well, as Ephesians, we're going to look at in a few moments, explains to us that we were all, I included, all of you sitting here, everyone ever born since Adam, we were all born under the shadow of sin, that by our very nature, we are sinners, so I always like to look at it like this, uh, just sinning, an individual sin does not make us a sinner, okay? You get that? Now before the stones start to fly, no, we sin because we are sinners. It's like when a dog barks, the barking does not make it a dog, right? The dog barks because it's a dog. Does that make sense? I mean, that's the way I always have always looked at it. To me, that makes sense. Okay? So there's the universal sin nature that all men born since Adam share. And there's no escaping that. Not on our own anyway. But there's also delayed judgment. Now, I mentioned that with Adam and Eve. That, that's a great picture of delayed judgment right there. But as Matthew 5, 45 says, or Jesus speaking to his disciples, he mentions the fact that God makes his reign fall upon what? Both the evil and the good, right? That's a picture of God's grace. That mankind, I, I, look at it this way. Uh, uh, Cornelius Van Til is a great apologist from way back. And he had this illustration. He was riding a train one day and he noticed a father holding his little girl. And the little girl stands up in her father's lap and slaps his face. And he used that as an analogy for those who reject God or for those who say there is no God, they have to stand in God's creation in order to slap him in the face. And yet, because of God's common grace, they, 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 uh, they exist and they move and they have their being, as Paul says. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us that it is Christ Jesus who is holding all things together. So even their very atoms still holding together uh, is by God's grace. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews tells us a very similar thing. So there is delayed judgment, which is a picture of God's grace. But then there is God's patience and delayed judgment. Why is it that God is delaying his judgment? And this is where I want you to take your Bibles and turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. So any of you remember the old song, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter? You remember? I learned that in, in VBS, Gosnell Baptist Church, Gosnell, Arkansas, years and years ago. So there are a few things I can remember. So 2 Peter chapter 3. Look at what he says in verse 9. Now this section, Peter's saying that in the, in the um, 
last hour of, of before the church is removed by the rapture, Peter is saying here that there are going to be those who come along and they're going to mock this idea that the, that, uh, the Lord Jesus is going to come. In verse 4, he says, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. And we see that today. We, we see that if you've paid any attention, you can see that. Uh, while the, the populace, the, the, the people around the world are sensing that, that something is coming to a head in, in this world uh, and that maybe the end is near, you have those, mostly those who've had the sense educated out of them, um, will, will criticize the idea of the rapture of the church. They criticize the idea of Jesus ever returning. And that's in fulfillment of what Peter and also what Paul had said, and I'm always tempted to put Mary in there, but I'm not going to, you know, thank you for the few of you who got that. I appreciate it. Makes me feel better. So Peter is, is warning about this time, but then he gives this explanation of why it is so. Why is it God hasn't, uh, the Lord Jesus hasn't come back, the uh, tribulation hasn't started, judgment hasn't come, upon, hasn't come upon the world. In verse 9 he says this, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. Why? Because he does not wish for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance, that repentance, meaning that change of mind of what you believe about Jesus Christ. That's why God's common grace is so important, because he's being patient. Elsewhere in Scripture, it says God takes no delight in the death of a, of a sinner. That's not, he doesn't delight in that. He doesn't want anyone to have to suffer his wrath. That's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to pay the penalty for our sin so that we wouldn't have to. All right. So then that brings us to particular grace. So turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. In verse 1, I'll read this while you're getting there. In verse 1 he says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Now, before I get to verse 3, I want you to recognize what he's saying there. This is important for us to realize. When, when we see uh, the lost person, when we see one who has not accepted Christ in their natural state, he says that they're walking according to the course of this world, this world system. And as, we see, as we've seen in the last few years, uh, how bad it's getting more and more, even the crime in Lubbock. So it's getting worse and worse. You know, Lubbock, this good, conservative, safe city. And what do you hear? You know, when I first moved here 12 and a half years ago, however long it was, I mean, maybe every now and again you'd hear someone got shot or there was a murder every now and again. But now it's like every other, well, not every other, every day. If you listen to KFYO, you know, someone's been shot, some, something's been stolen, and just go down the list. And crime is getting worse and worse and worse. That's the course of this age. And the course of this age is slowly circling the drain, all right? But the lost person, you and I even, were walking according to that world system, according to or in accordance with or under the influence of the prince of the power of the air. Now, I wonder who that could be talking about. It's not talking about Jesus, right? It's talking about Satan, the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So that's where they were right? Well, he goes on in verse 3 then, among them we too, so he's making sure not to leave us out, right, or himself, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, I want you to notice those words, by nature, children of wrath, even as the rest. So what does he mean by nature? The Greek word, and you could probably, and I didn't think to look it up in the English, but probably the same thing, uh, same meaning. It means our natural qualities or our very constitution. Okay, we're all familiar with that term, constitution. What is the founding of the United States? It's the constitution. It's the, it sets the limits on the executive branch. It sets the limits on the legislative branch. It sets the limits on the presidential branch. That's the constitution. So there's the constitution and then the people in the positions and the constitution is supposed to be dictating how they operate. 
okay? Our Constitution, as lost people, dictates how we operate. So our Constitution, before we have believed in Christ, our Constitution is that we're walking like uh, the, all of those who are walking according to the course of this world and living in the lust of our flesh and indulging the desires of our flesh and of the mind. So by our very nature, we were what? Children of wrath. People who deserve the wrath of God. Children above whom the wrath of God was just waiting, like, like the old uh, sermon by uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God, that they're being held up by a string above hell, and that string could snap any moment, and they'll f fall into hell and be judged eternally by God's judgment. That's what we were by our very makeup. So just as a dog barks because he's a dog, we sin because we're sinners. That's the universal sin nature. Then we have on top of that imputed sin. So if you turn to uh, Romans chapter 5 for me. All right. In Romans chapter 5, we're not going to read all of this. But this is where he's comparing the first Adam and the last Adam. And Paul says, therefore, just as through one man, that would be Adam, sin entered into the world and death through sin. So death spread to all men because all sinned. All right. That is called imputed righteousness. What does that word imputed mean? And if I recall my language correctly, that imputed is a, is a uh, 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 banking term type thing where, where there, something is put upon your account. So not only are we, by our very nature, sinners, but we have the sin of Adam put on our account. And there's no way to erase that, except Paul goes on talking about the free gift that comes through Jesus Christ by His grace. Received by faith. Okay? So we won't spend any more time on that, but that's imputed sin. And then there's personal sins. All right? and again, those personal sins come out of our being sinners. So in uh, Romans 3, uh, what then? Are we better than they? That's, he's saying, are, are we Jews any better than the Gentiles or the Greeks? He says, not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. And he goes on and on and on. He's talking about those personal sins that flow out of our sin natures. So you can basically what he's saying is that the sin nature is there and here's how you can see it. This is their behavior, okay? Those are personal sins. And finally, because of our makeup, I would say not even so much so because of our personal sins, but because of our very makeup, we are enemies of God. So back over again, Romans 5, 10. For while we were what? Enemies. Enemies of who? Well, the context tells us we're enemies of God because we were reconciled to God while we were still enemies, and we, it was done so through the death of His Son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Now, you can hold on to that word reconciled because we're going to come back to that in just a few moments. And then again, we are incapable of righteousness. Isaiah uh, uh, 64. And I always butcher this verse, so you don't have to go there. I'm going to go there so that I don't butcher it this time. But in, it was here earlier. Hold on. Isaiah's in the Old Testament, right? Used to be? Okay. All right. So in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, it says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. I'll just stop there, okay? So we've all become unclean, according to Isaiah. And every good deed that we can do is nothing but a filthy garment in the eyes of God. So we're incapable of righteousness in the eyes of God. Now, we can do good man-to-man, -man, things that I can look at and see that a lost person, for instance, can, can do great good for me in whatever capacity. Okay? So humanly speaking, there are good things we do, but in God's eyes, that's that, uh, done outside of Christ, 
uh, done outside of believing in him, uh, it's nothing but a, a filthy garment in the eyes of God. And finally, we're not going to go back to Romans chapter 3, but we, we just read much of that. In Romans 3, it says that we have no desire for God. We had no desire for God when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Okay? None seek after him. There's none righteous and none seek after him. All right, so just to sum it up, God's unmerited, unearned favor overcomes the effects of our sin nature to bring the lost or to bring us into a right relationship with God. That is great news. And there ought to be hooping and hollering and amen, and, but Dan's not here this morning. So as a matter of fact, please pray for Dan. They had to take him back to the heart hospital last night, and I didn't mention that. So please be praying for Dan Hanna. But he's my amener. Um, I'm just looking at y'all because y'all are staring at me, so I'm going to stare back. Right? Amen. I was just thinking about <laughs> when we were singing, uh, I can't, uh, uh, I think it was uh, Love Lifted Me. That's what we were singing that. And I was looking out and I'm looking at everybody and I saw one smiling face. The rest of us were like, Love Lifted Me. <laughs> and then I got to thinking, that's what I'm doing. Because I've always got this serious look on my face. And so I'm probably singing, Love Lifted Me, you know. Nobody asked you. <laughs> All right. So that's the need for grace. So let's look at the results of grace. Here's where things start getting really good. Now, if you were to go to, and I don't know if Major Bible Themes has this, but in, in Lewisbury Chaffer's Systematic Theology, I think it's in volume three, he has a list of 33 um, results, I guess, of, of grace uh, when, we come, when we become believers. Now, I think some of them... It might be debatable, I don't know, but, but it's a great list. And I've, matter of fact, I've got a copy of it here in my, in my Bible, right here. 33 things uh, that, uh, are, that are the riches of God's grace that we receive at the moment we believe. And so I wanted to look at this idea of the results of grace. So we're going to go through all 33 of them in depth this morning. No, I, I decided just to choose a few because it's, it wouldn't be possible to go through them in one setting. And the first thing is this wonderful gift that we are forgiven of all sin, including the sin nature. So our sin nature is dealt with at the cross of Jesus Christ. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6 that we were buried with Christ in his death. How that works, we don't know. It, does, it doesn't explain, it just says that's the facts, Jack. That it, it, when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, somehow in God's mind or in his way of doing things, we are then transported back to the cross of Christ and we are buried with him in that moment. Our sins uh, or our, uh, um, our old man, he says, has been crucified with Christ. And therefore, I no longer live, but it is Christ who lives in me, he says in 1 Corinthians. Man, that is good news. Our sins have been forgiven. My sin nature, that that thing that I couldn't change. It's, it's, you can't change your sin nature any more than you can change your DNA. But it is taken care of at the cross of Christ. Look at Colossians uh, chapter 2. And so if y'all get tired of cha you know, chasing uh, these passages through the Bible, um, you know, get over it because you need to. You need to see these things for yourself. Look what he says, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with Christ, having forgiven us all our transgressions through the work of Jesus Christ. God's grace given to us at the moment we believe. So all of our sins are forgiven. Not only that, we are reconciled to God. We read that just a few moments ago, the fact that we are reconciled to God. And what does that mean? There's a great Greek word, katalasso. It means to change a person from enmity to friendship. And you say, what does enmity mean? I have no idea. But it means, no, we were at loggerheads with God. We were his enemies. We were at war against him. And through the blood of Jesus Christ, when you put your faith in Jesus, you are taken from being an enemy of God to being a friend of God. For instance, um, let's look at 2 Corinthians. Well, we're already in Colossians. Let's just stay there. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 22, 
Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Now that there offers for us several other things that have been done for us at the moment we believe. We have been made holy. We have been made blameless. We have been made beyond reproach in Christ. Through his death on the cross, the good thing about his death on the cross is that he rose again and he is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. And for anyone who has never put their faith in him, all you have to do is accept that gift that he offers to you now through faith. So we're reconciled. So just a quick summary for that. Our natural condition, enemies of God. Jesus took our punishment so that we wouldn't have to. So that judgment that we deserve, justice, Jesus took it for us. And the result is that we are transformed from enemies to friends of God. The next thing we find is that we are redeemed. Now, here's some interesting things. Now, for those of you who've been coming for a while, you've probably heard all of this a hundred times or more. But just for those who haven't, and and for a good refresher for the rest of us, it'd be good to walk through this. There are several words in the Greek that are used in the New Testament for this idea of being redeemed. And the first one is agorazo. It's from a Greek word, agora. Does anybody know what the agora is? It's the marketplace. Okay, so that's what this is for. And so it gives us the idea of someone going to Walmart. Well, no, that's more like going... To the hot spot. Let's uh, go into marketplace. Some of you will get that later when you wake up. Um, it's like going to the market, the market street and purchasing something, right? So that's what agarazzo is. It's like going into the market and buying something. In this case, it's going into, as, as Lewis Berry Chafer would put it, it's going into the marketplace of sin and it's purchasing us. So we've been purchased by God. We're not going to look at the passages, uh, jot them down. You can look at them later just for time's sake. We'll we'll not look at those. So we've been purchased by God. That's agorazo. But then there's ex agorazo. It means to buy up. Uh, It means to secure the deliverance or uh, or to deliver or to liberate. Ex agorazo. That's agorazo, obviously, with that prefix ex out of. So it's uh, or ex, which means out of. So it's to, to buy out of. So it gives us a sense of buying in the marketplace and being taken out of the marketplace. Okay. Picture that now you're, you're, you're in the marketplace of sin. You're a slave. You're on the, you're on the slave uh, auctioning block in the marketplace of sin. And the Lord Jesus comes in and he purchases you agarazzo. But not only does he purchase you, he takes you off the market. Not even one. Do you not understand? I know you do, and you're just all shy. See, I grew up Southern Baptist and Missionary Baptist, and so I once had, a, we had a, a pastor who was between churches come to our church, a little Missionary Baptist church, and I once counted 100 amens from him during one evening service before I stopped counting, okay? I don't expect that, and please don't, because I'd be laughing if you did. But this is exciting, we're taken, we're, we're off the market, people. We're no longer slaves in the slave market of sin. That's why Paul says we're no longer slaves to sin. We've been freed. That takes us to that next word, lutrao. It's from a Greek word, luo, which means to loose or to let loose. And so he comes to the marketplace of sin and he buys us. Not only that, he takes us out of the marketplace of sin and then he releases us. That's good news. And, and just simply to, to kind of put a point on this, let's go over to, to 1 Peter again. You know what? We're closer to Titus. Let's go to Titus. First and Second Timothy, Titus and Philemon. All right, so Titus chapter 2. Here's where this lutrao is used. Who gave himself for us to redeem us or to, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, free us 
from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Now, now notice that. We, I didn't think to get into this today uh, because of my focus, but notice what he says here. He didn't just free us just so that we could go do whatever we wanted to. There was a purpose behind it. What was it? To purify for himself a people for his own possession. And those people are, have, a, have another purpose. And that is to be zealous for good deeds. Are you zealous for good deeds? Are you zealous uh, to do things for the Lord Jesus Christ, and for his, uh, his uh, coming kingdom someday? That's something to think about. And there's one more. This isn't talked about as much, but it's apolutrosis. Uh, again, the, the lutrao is there. The, the, the uh, prefix apo means away from. So it's to purchase, kind of to purchase away from. And it's a, a release from a captive condition. And in an abstract sense, this is a noun that is used for Jesus Christ himself. He is our redeemer. Okay? And uh, we could go to, to 1 Corinthians or Romans, and we'll, we'll, you can look those up later. Okay? So we're redeemed. What is the summary? First of all, the people. And this I got this from uh, Dr. Ryrie's book. Uh, uh, I think it was his book, Basic Theology. So if you want to go look that up, I think that's where that is. But he says that people, first of all, are redeemed from something, namely from the marketplace or slavery of sin. Secondly, people are redeemed by something, namely by the payment of a price, the blood of Christ. And that's where I think both Peter and Paul mentioned that we were bought with a price, and it's a high price, the blood of the Son of God himself. It's a high price. And then finally, people are redeemed to something, namely to a state of freedom. But here's the catch. Then we're called upon to renounce that freedom for slavery to the Lord who redeemed us. And also, the next thing we see is that we have eternal life. Did you realize that at this very moment, if you've, per, if, you, if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ and you've experienced, now it's, when I say experience, I don't mean it's something you're going to feel, you're not going to taste it, you're not going to smell it, you're not going to be able to touch it, but it's an experience that you have because when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you've been baptized into his death and you've been raised to walk in new life. You can't feel it. You, you have no sensation of it, but it's something that has happened to you. Now we find we have, present tense, eternal life. Did you know that? That right now you possess. It's not something you're waiting for. It's something that you have. So that if you were to die today, having believed in Jesus Christ, you go on to eternity in glory, as we used to say in the old uh, Baptist churches I grew up in. You go on to glory. You get to see him face to face. You don't get to spend eternity in hell. You spend eternity with him, and that's eternal life. Do you understand the difference between spiritual death and spiritual life? Spiritual death occurred when Adam and Eve sinned. He said, if you, if you eat this fruit, you're going to die. Did they die physically when they uh, ate the fruit? Well, eventually, but no, they didn't die immediately, but they did die. They died spiritually. What does that mean? The idea of death is the idea of separation. So when a physical body dies, my being, my soul, my spirit, however you want to look at it, is separated from my body. I go on existing. And that's, that's the spiritual, or that's the physical sense. The spiritual sense is when Adam and Eve fell they experienced a separation from God. God cast them out of the garden. There was no longer that intimate relationship they had. And there was always this constant separation between God and man until the Lord Jesus Christ came and paid the penalty for our sin and redeemed us and reconciled us and forgave us of all of our sins. And he brought us back into the right relationship with God. So now we have spiritual life that goes on for eternity. So Romans 6.22, Paul says, but now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification, which Lord willing, we'll start looking at next week, and the outcome, eternal life. John 3.16, for God so loved the world 
I just went blank. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him has, present tense, eternal life. Right? Shall not perish, but has eternal life. That's the great news. Finally, well not finally, but next, is I'm adopted. This is where we go back to Ephesians, all right? So go back to Ephesians real quick. We're almost done, so just hang in there for a few more minutes. I'm going to go ahead and read beginning in verse 3, where Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Did you realize that come praise and glorify, that song we sang, is taken from these, this passage? Verse 3 through 14, come praise and glorify our God. Just a side note there. So he goes on uh, in verse 4, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. According to what? According to we've earned it? No, according to the kind intention of his will. So let's look at some of this real quickly. First of all, God chose us. That in itself is a reason to glorify God. Why? Because we just saw in Romans chapter 3 where none seek after him. We just saw where that in our lost estate, we were enemies of God, and yet he chose us. And he chose us in Christ, in, con in conjunction with what Christ has done on the cross. Christ made it possible for us to become children of God. So he chose us. That's a reason to celebrate. And it's based on Christ's work on our behalf. It, it, what he says here is he chose us in him that would be in Christ from verse 3. It's in association with Christ, with the, the fact that he purchased our salvation. He did this all before laying down the foundation of the earth. So in eternity past, this plan was already in motion. He already had it planned. It's impossible for me to think that God doesn't have a thought. In other words, I could be thinking of one thing now and thinking of something in 10 seconds because that's just the way my mind works. It jumps from one thing to the next. None of it means anything, but it does, right? So, uh, but, but God doesn't have a thought. It's all there. It's just amazing to try to wrap your head around who God is when you think of something like that. It, I, I won't even try to go any further with that because it's just mind-boggling. But before laying down the foundation of the world, he had already chosen you. Now, we could get into this doctrine of election and everything. We're not going to do that today. It's very tricky. It's very difficult to understand. But what we do know is that God chose us to be, well, he tells us here, for the purpose to be holy and blameless before him. And he goes on in verse five, uh, that la those last two words of verse four probably belong with verse five, in love he predestined us. And so he predetermined, that's what predestined means. You have a destiny, that destiny has been set beforehand, pre, so he predetermined what? He pre predetermined that we would be adopted as his sons. That whole idea of being adopted, we could go into that, which is a mag just a magnificent doctrine of adoption, but we don't have time to do that. But this is what he predetermined before the foundation of the world. And again, he did it through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. That is a picture of God's grace. It's something we did not deserve. It's not something we were looking for. And it is something that we probably rejected a time or two before we really came to understand and believe. So Ephesians 1, 6, this is to the praise of the glory of his grace. He did this for his own praise. Now for us, we would think, well, that seems egotistical. Well, it's like the old saying goes, it's not bragging if it's true. And that doesn't really fit God because there is no, no, uh, no sin in God. There's no darkness in God. He is the only one who truly deserves praise and glory. And so he's done this for our benefit, but for his praise. And so when we talk about this subject, we should be praising God for his grace. Finally, we are justified by grace through faith. Justification is a one-time act. It's not, a, it's not progressive. It's just at the moment you believe, the, the judge brings down the, the gavel and says, not guilty. Why? 
because I don't deserve his justice? No, because Jesus purchased my salvation. And I am in Christ, and when God looks at me, he sees the righteousness of Christ. When God looks at you, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, he doesn't see a, a dirty, rotten, scoundrel sinner. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ as your clothing. And he looks and he says, you are justified. You are not guilty based upon the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord willing, we'll look at a little bit more of this idea of justi justification by grace next week as well as sanctification. But I think, or at least I hope, I've made pretty clear uh, the grace of God is all hinging upon uh, the, the work of Christ on the cross. Yes, there's common grace, which God shows to everyone by not immediately judging us uh, like we need to. But there's that particular grace, that salvific grace, grace that brings salvation, that was purchased by Jesus Christ. Not any work that we could do, but the, work, the perfect work that he has done. And he offers that salvation to anyone who will trust in him for it. So that's where we end today. Lord willing, like I said, we'll continue looking at some more dimensions of this topic next week. Father, we thank you for your word and pray that we've handled it correctly today. I pray that you receive glory from it. And Lord, if, if anything's been taught that, that's been erroneous on my part, I pray that you help us to, to pinpoint that and to clarify or correct whatever it may need to be. And Lord, as we leave this place, your, your word says that, that we've been redeemed uh, in order that we might be presented before you and before Christ as a holy, pure people who are zealous for good works. Allow us this week, or Holy Spirit, work in us this week to to, to, to fulfill that uh, program for which we've been saved, to do good works uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ and for our God. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand and sing with me? Mm -hmm.